We're joined by senior producer from NFL Films, Greg Cosell, who's going to dive into the X's and O's with us as we get ready for Bill's Bucks, the featured matchup on CBS in the four o'clock window on Sunday. Greg, how you doing? Uh, Chris, I'm doing great. Uh, Mr. Tasker, how are you? I'm doing extremely well. Thanks for coming on with us again. I trust you have some overarching thoughts about what happened in the 40 mile an hour win game last Monday night and, and how it, and how, what kind of arrows it points towards what's going to happen in Tampa this weekend. Um, I don't, I don't know if they're overarching, maybe it's pointless, but you know, I do have some thoughts, <laughs> you know, I, I grew up, you know, and I grew up, but I've, I lived with uh, my wife and, and two daughters. So my thoughts are usually not overarching. They're usually more pointless. You're right. so, uh... <laughs> or so you've been told. Yeah. I'm used to that. Right. <laughs> Um, Give us your thoughts about that game on Monday night. Yeah, I kept thinking watching the game, and this was live because I ended up watching the whole game live because it went by so quickly. I mean, normally I don't make it through the Monday night game, but it ended like a quarter to 11 because it was so fast. Um, I kept thinking to myself, what was plan B for Bill Belichick? Because you know he does not go into a game with one approach. Um, I firmly believe, and I love your point of view on this, I think that would have been his game plan, even if the weather was 60 and sunny. I think he believed, this is, again, my opinion, just based on, and and, hey, I'm not in Bill Belichick's head, but I've spoken to a couple of former coaches who are friends of mine. Um, I think he believed that the Bills could not score on his defense meaningfully because the Bills, as we've discussed, and, you know, I can only tell you what the tape shows, and you guys are well aware of this, I think he believed with the, the Bills' inability to run the ball, and, and they tried. They came out with six O-linemen, you know, two tight ends. They tried to run the ball, but they can't. And with their O-line issues in pass protection, um, I think he believed that the Bills could not score and that he would play. he would have played that way regardless of the weather. Yeah, and he was helped yeah. by the weather, you could argue, too. Oh, without with, question. With that approach. Um, the question I have for you, though, Greg, is – they're 12 games in by this point in the season, you are what you are identity wise on offense, yes. defense, special teams. You mentioned it. They're having trouble running the football, but there are also times where protection is not holding up for Josh to make Correct. plays. So a lot of bills fans are saying, well, I'll just do more of what you did last year. Throw the <laughs> ball, throw the ball all over the yard and do that and forget about running the football. Cause at times last year, the run game seemed like an afterthought. Um, so there's a danger there, though, in being so one-dimensional that you allow teams to just tee off on Josh and the pass protection, which isn't sound all the time. So you can't just say, let's just throw it all over the yard. How do you find a balance there in maybe leaning more heavily on the passing game strength without making it so obvious that opponents just say, we're pinning our ears back and we're coming. Well, you know, I'd answer that, Chris, by saying this. I think they've tried to do that. And that's one reason I think the passing game, in many respects, has been a much more of a sustaining approach. We've not seen the bigger plays in the pass game this year that we saw a year ago. Now, I think some defenses are playing them differently as well with more to, to shell. But I think they've tried to develop a more quick rhythm pass game where the ball comes out. The problem with that is it's not a problem necessarily, but teams then recognize that and they sometimes sit on it. And, and at some point you can't let teams sit on your passing game. Uh, Steve, you know, this very well. Um, And then you have to try to create through your route concepts and combinations, a way to get the ball down the field And that's where the issue of the O-line comes into play. So it's at times it's been kind of a catch 22. Um, And, and just to show you how games and seasons can hinge on one play or two plays or three plays. Think about the different conversation we might be having right now. If Stefan Diggs caught that ball on Monday night, or if Bass did not miss that field goal by two inches Um, and, and then they could kick a field goal at the end of the game to win it, you know, and again, I know you can play the what if game all you want and, and teams that are, uh, bills are not a losing team, but losing teams tend to play the what if game. But, you know, I think that when you look overview wise, that's the issue with their offense. So here's what happens. Every play becomes a referendum on Josh Allen because they can't run it. 
Their pass protection is spotty, which is a great term that you used, Chris, and that's correct. Um, and therefore, Josh has to be great every play, and that's unrealistic. Yeah, and it, it seems as though that's the conversation you see at point, and you see everything on social media, and the, and the fan base comes from every angle possible, of course. Of course. But you do get a sense that there is – an, an either a, an innate desire by Josh at points, or even uh, when you get look at even as a total package, that there really are times stretches in games where that everybody just expects Josh to heft everything onto his shoulders and just carry the entire show. Um, you get that both from his actions and his play, and also some of the decisions he makes, and also some of the play calling as well. Um, that yeah, it, and, if and, Josh and can't do it, it's point. not going to get done. Right, and that's a great point. And you know what? That's really hard, Steve. You know how hard that is for a quarterback. I right. mean, there's very few quarterbacks probably in the history of the game who you could say could do that week after week after week after week. That's just a really difficult way to play. Right. And, you know, I think that Josh and I think, uh, you know, you guys know I'm on record as believing that he is, in terms of physical gifts, the most physically gifted in the league, but he does have an aggressive mentality. And the issue you do run into with that is he can become reckless at times if you're always asking him to have to be the one to make plays. And because he just has right. the same mentality that allows him to be the good Josh Allen at times will lead to some reckless and undisciplined plays. And you try to channel that, but if there's nothing else to your offense, it becomes hard to channel that because you have to ask him to do it all. Yeah. Well, one of the all things. Right, so let go, go ahead, ahead, Steve. Uh, well, I was going to say that with Josh, and we've heard this too. Like down in the red zone, they had first and goal on the six, and there's people clamoring. Like one of the things that they're not doing in the red zone this year, as much as they did a year ago or two, certainly two years He's ago, running is him. running him. And yeah. I and I have no problem with that. I get it. But here's the thing: if you want to do that, Josh Allen is quickly going to become Cam Newton. Yeah. Uh, and that means also that he's going to be out of the league at the end of this contract, right? Yep. So uh, that's not something you want to have your quarterback do too much. Certainly, occasionally, it helps to keep the defense honest and that kind of thing. But if you're going to rely on your quarterback to be your short yardage goal line back, you're going to pay a price eventually. I couldn't agree more. No matter how big your quarterback is, you know, there, there are select situations, and maybe that's what people are responding to. And as you said, Steve, that's fair. You understand that, just like I do. And I'm sure, Chris, you do as well. Mm -hmm. But you can't build your running game around Josh Allen. Yeah, right. So let's let's look at this game Sunday, specifically. The Bucks, as we know, have had an injury-riddled secondary. I got a lot of thoughts on this one, too, Chris. Yeah, their corners <laughs> – yeah, I'm sure you do. The corners, <laughs> the corners are getting healthier. The safeties are not. Jordan Whitehead is out for this game. Bruce Arian said that after practice today. So they basically have Antoine Winfield Jr. and a couple of fill-in guys. Like Adams Andrew is filling Adams. in because Mike Edwards is right. an idiot. Yeah. And Ross Cockrell has filled in, too. There was the yeah. notion floated that maybe even Richard Sherman could see some time at safety on Sunday. Do you see advantages for the Bills passing game because of the thin nature of those safety positions? Or is their front four so good that you think they'll be able to cover up those deficiencies? Well, let's let's be realistic here. That's all I can do. You know, that's why you guys bring me on, you know, based on my tape study and what I think could happen. Um, it all obviously has to start with protection. But I think what you could see is because there's no other way they can win other than Josh being the really good Josh, okay? There's no other way they can win on offense. Uh -huh. So I think you might see 10 personnel, four wide for this reason. Uh, two reasons. Number one, you know what you're going to get coverage-wise. This is a team that does not play a lot of man coverage. They're heavy zone coverage. So you know what you're going to get on the back end. Number two, they do not play dime. They do not play with six defensive backs. They've played only 11 snaps all season, with six defensive backs. So unless Todd Bowles, and you never know this, but unless Todd Bowles changes, I would love to see how the Bucks, and, and maybe Brian Dable and Sean McDermott would like to see it as well, how the Bucks will react to 10 personnel. Because if you can pretty much say, hey, we're, we know we're going to get zone, we know we're going to get specific zone concepts, then you know you can attack them with specific route concepts. So it would not surprise me to see 10 personnel, four wide, 
of course, protection is is always the issue every week. So that's just a given. Yeah. So and then just you- to follow up on that real quick, Steve, let me let me just follow up real quick here. A lot of people have been pining for more time on the field for Gabriel Davis. Yeah. Uh, we've argued that he's the best blocking receiver on the roster, number one. And then number two, every time he's on the field, good things seem to happen. What does your film study tell you about Gabriel Davis? I like Gabriel Davis. I really liked him coming out of college. He was a really interesting evaluation because he literally lined up on every single snap about two yards from the sideline. But I think he's long. I think he's athletic. I think he moves well. I think he can make tough catches. We saw him as a rookie a year ago. He was, I thought he had a, you know, a really bright future. So again, I'm not there every day, so I can't speak to the, you know, what goes on in the building, but uh, you know, I think that he's, he's a really solid player. Now, uh, you know, I think that he needs to get snaps this week. So we'll see. I mean, look, you look at their receiving core and it's a good receiving core. Uh, you know, and I think to me, they only have really one way they can win on offense. And by the way, that's never a good thing either. So it's, but that's the reality of life right now for the Bills offense. Yeah. And it's, it's throwing the football. Am, am I right? Is that what yeah. you're getting at? <laughs> yeah. Is throwing yeah. the football. It's not. It's not just Josh. I mean, it's Josh right. throwing the football to spread it out. And if they go ten personnel, like we're suggesting they might, then it does call into question their ability to protect the four. The front four for Big Tampa time. Bay is very good. Is very good. Give us on a, the inside. Yeah, now give you us your rundown. Those, yeah, now that you get into those inside matchups with dealing with Sue and Vea, and Vea is, I mean. He's got feet like a running back. He is a phenomenal athlete for a man that size. He looks like a ballet dancer at times. So, no, look, I'm not suggesting – what I suggested, I'm not saying that that means they're going to win 30 to 24. I'm just saying I don't know if they have another real option. I think it's a valid option, but protection becomes the issue. And that's why I think you, you've seen them this year in every game do a lot of quick game stuff because they just – I don't think – I think they know – you guys know, Steve, you've been around a long time doing this, you know, playing for a team. Every coach knows the weakness and limitations of specific players and specific units. That's just right. the way it is. So when you go into a game, you know, you, you have an understanding of, hey, here's how I think we can win. But I also know that there will be some issues and we hope we can get through those issues. And, you know, we can do enough of the good things that we can win. We know they're not going to run the ball because, you know what, nobody runs the ball on the Bucks, and the Bills are not going to. And then right. let's flip it around here, Greg, because Leonard Fournette has suddenly become a dual threat back. Yeah, uh, we were we were talking to Dave Moore, a former Bills tight end, but predominantly a Tampa Bay Buck tight end. Remember him? Uh, who's on the radio network now? And he was saying that every he was a late arrival last year, as you know, um, and he said every day after practice, he would have a 15 to 20 minute throwing session with Tom Brady every single day. And he continued that again this year. And lo and behold, this guy is now a dual threat back and he is a load. I mean, this is a big man. Um, How do you see the bills defending a guy like that, knowing the physical backs earlier in the season have had some measure of success against the bills and, and not to mention the fact they've got a pretty big offensive line. They've got some big bodies up there. And a pretty good wide receiving core. So, well, yes, I was going to get to that, but yeah, yeah. (laughs) you know, and and I'll answer that this way. I think much of what Fournette does is a function of Brady because one of the things Brady has done his entire career, it's actually the reason he became the starter in 2001 over Bledsoe, is because if you give Brady the six-yard check down, Brady takes the six-yard check down. He doesn't sit in the pocket and wait for something to develop down the field. So Fournette catches a ton of quick checkdowns where Brady has eliminated something down the field right away. He's not waiting to see, oh, maybe Evans is going to get there. Uh Uh-uh. He doesn't wait for that. He'll throw it to Fournette right away, and if it's six yards, he'll take second and four every snap. And if you do the same thing the next snap, he'll get the first down and move on. So Fournette becomes a big player in their pass game, not on intermediate or vertical routes. Every once in a while, he might run a wheel. or But, I mean, for the most part, he catches short balls where he's got a little space, and and sometimes the six-yarder becomes a 12-yarder. And, you know, all of a sudden, you, they move down the field because Brady is a master at that. And Brady is also a master at not getting hit. 
Um, he has had the most dropbacks, I believe, in the NFL this year and has been hit the fewest times because, number one, right. he wins before the snap, so he knows where to go with the ball. And number two, if he really feels like there's nothing on that play, he will not take a negative play and he will live to play the next play. And as, with this game on the horizon, Bills fans, what gives them the most angst is the fact that they're afraid that Tom Brady won't throw it 20 times. He'll throw it four throw times. It or he throw, he'll throw it four times and hand it off to Fournette. Can the, does the Bucks running game, get, given the problems and, and the reputation of the Bills' defense, what, what, chances, what chance is there that the Bucks just hand well, it off all day? Let's look at it this way. If you're Bruce Arians and your personal bent is to throw the ball and you look at the Bills D, you probably see a couple of things. You see they don't have a great pass rush, okay? That's that's what the film shows. You see that they have a backup at corner uh, opposite Levi Wallace. That's what the film shows. That's who's playing. So you could also look at this game from the perspective of Bruce Arians and think, you know what? We're going to drop back 45 times. I mean, the, the are they going to cover Evans and Godwin? Um, Brashad Perriman actually was their number three receiver yeah. last week, which was really right. interesting. And he played a ton of snaps. Um, but he's a big man who can still run a little bit. Um, so if you look at this defense, I mean, look what they did against Atlanta last week. You know, they obviously felt they could line up a team that can't rush the quarterback and a team that, you know, is is not great in pass coverage. Um, and they, they, by choice, had him drop back 50 times. That was by choice. You know, that's not because they had to. So are they going to drop back 50 times against the Bills? None of us know that. But you could look at the Bills D and they could think, you know what? We can drop back 40 times, no problem. Yeah. And right. speaking of that, you know, I looked back at Brady's record in the McDermott era against the Bills. Granted, it was with the Patriots. And the Bills have done a good job of holding him below what his typical per game totals are or right. percentages are. I mean, he even only in six games in a Patriots uniform in the McDermott era, four touchdowns, five picks. So they've been opportunistic against Brady, but I think the difference here is he's got wall to wall weapons to Correct. use, which he never really had in to New that England. degree in New England. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's got, he's got receivers who can win one all one. I mean, he's got Evans who's obviously terrific. Godwin now that Perriman is playing has gone back to the slot. So, so the question becomes, you know, the bills will likely, I would think play more zone than man. I just don't think they can match up real well on the perimeter. And one thing about Brady, he does throw to the one-on-ones. So if he sees Evans one-on-one -on -one with either Levi Wallace or Dane Jackson, I assume it'll be correct guys. Yeah. Yeah. I, he's going to throw, he's going to throw this walls. And we haven't even talked about Gronkowski who in the last couple of weeks right. has really become a big factor in their pass game. Now that he's gotten healthy. What do you think? I know you're not into prognostication or anything like that. If these teams play their best and to their strengths, what's this game look like? Well, I think that Josh would have to have a sensational game. I really do. And again, I'm not saying they're going to get blown out or anything like that. I don't talk like that. You know, I mean, and I think that, I know Sean McDermott and Leslie, and I guarantee this was not a fun week in Bill's land. And, and I really don't think they're going to come out and play badly. I mean, I don't know what that means as far as a score. It's not like the bills are a bad team, but you know, I think that Josh will have to play great. And is he capable of it? Absolutely. And, and you know, what kind of person he is better than I do. You're around him, you know, but uh, you know, I think that, I, I think that they're going to have to, in some way, slow down this pass game for the for the uh, Bucks. If they can't do that, it's going to be a tough deal. Right, Greg. As always, we thank you for the input, sir. Uh, we'll cross our fingers and toes that uh, the Bills can get back on the winning track this week. They have traded wins for losses each of the last yeah, eight we, weeks, we, we, so we, they're we due. Need a Bills win. We need a Bills win here, Chris. Come on now. <laughs> You're there. Come on, get them. Get them yeah. pumped up. Maybe they'll bring you in for the pregame speech. Oh, I don't know if that's a wise move, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure they've got a better option than that. But, but, but thank, thanks for thinking so highly of me. Uh, we'll catch up with you next week, Greg. Thanks very thanks, much. Greg. All right, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks.